I'm Ron McGill coming to you from the Amazon and Beyond exhibit here at Zoo Miami as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And unfortunately, most of us have to be home as we face the challenges of this precedent-setting pandemic. It doesn't mean we can't celebrate the values, the messaging, the importance of what Earth Day represents. Back in 1970, when Earth Day was first established, there was no Endangered Species Act. There was no Marine Mammal Protection Act. There was no Clean Air Act. There was no Clean Water Act. All these things have come about partially as a result of Earth Day and the awareness that it's brought about. We here at Zoo Miami work with other accredited institutions to try to make people understand the value of all these creatures, all this wonderful wildlife that we share this Earth with. Now, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need any zoos. In a perfect world, every kid would be able to go to Africa and see an elephant walking in the Serengeti, go to the Arctic to see a polar bear on sea ice, go down into South America to see a jaguar in the jungle. Unfortunately, we don't live in a perfect world. And it's important, it's important especially for children to be able to connect with our world's wildlife. And that's what zoos like Zoo Miami do. If they do it the right way, they provide windows into that world so that when a kid comes to the zoo and sees an animal, something happens with that connection. There is a seed planted that hopefully will grow into a tree of strength and of passion for our world and our wildlife. DDT almost wiped out species like the bald eagle. These are all things that have helped wildlife recover. We cannot allow the pressures of economic development undermine the value of our wildlife, of the earth, that is directly responsible for the quality of life for all of us. From the bees that pollinate the plants that supply us with our fruits and vegetables, to the oceans that supply us with so much of the food that helps sustain us, it is all directly connected to the health of the planet. And when these things get in jeopardy, our quality of life comes into jeopardy. That's not to say there isn't hope. Some of the things we've seen just during this pandemic, if you had to look at any positive sign, look at how you can see the skyline in China. Look how the waterways and beaches have cleaned. Animals have returned to areas where they hadn't previously been seen. It's given the earth a chance to breathe. It is a sign that the earth is resilient. We just need to help protect it. This Earth Day is here to remind us on this 50th anniversary, though we can't celebrate our normal party for the planet here at Zoo Miami, you can still celebrate this great planet we live on by helping to protect it. We're facing enormous challenges. We've got to do what we can to turn this around. Every species is part of a link in the chain that is a direct reflection on the quality of life for all of us. Climate is changing. It is changing the way things are happening with wildlife, whether it be the migration of birds, whether it be sea level rise, from the things happening in Antarctica with massive melts to the fires in Australia, due to massive droughts. These are all indicators of changes in climate. We need to pay attention. It is not without hope. The Earth is showing us that it can recover. We need to help it. We need to support it. We need to defend those laws, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency. These are things that are all developed, designed to protect us, protect our quality of life. This has nothing to do with just liking animals or just liking the environment. It has to do with protecting ourselves, protecting the future generations. If there's one thought I want to leave you with on this Earth Day, remember this. We have not inherited this Earth from our parents. We are borrowing it from our children. We owe it to them to protect it for their generation and the generations after that. Enjoy this Earth Day and may there be many more. Hey, it's Ron McGill here in my office at Zoo Miami, trying to answer some of the questions y'all have been sending in regarding our Zoo Academy series. First question is a series of questions that comes from seven-year-old Valeria. One of the first questions she asks is, why do we need zoos? What is the purpose of zoos? Well, there's a lot of purposes to zoos, good zoos, Valeria. You need to distinguish between a good zoo that does things for the animals, on behalf of the animals, and a roadside attraction, or people who say they have a zoo and they call it something else, but it really is not a zoo. This is more like a, just a horrible roadside attraction. A good accredited zoo maintains animals in a large, open air, healthy environment. The health of the animals is the number one concern. Um, we provide windows into the world. You know, Valeria, 
if we lived in a perfect world, we probably wouldn't need any zoos because in a perfect world, everybody would be able to go to Africa to see an elephant walking in the Serengeti, go to the Arctic to see a polar bear on sea ice, go down in the Amazon to see a jaguar in the river. But the reality is we don't live in a perfect world and most people will never get the opportunity to see those animals. So zoos serve a purpose by providing windows into that world so that people like yourself can go to a zoo and see that animal face to face. There's nothing that that duplicates that impression, that first impression of looking at an animal eye to eye. No photograph, no television show, no book is going to, to duplicate that response, that, that feeling you get when you look at an animal and realize how majestic, how beautiful, how incredible it is. So zoos serve that purpose by providing that window to hopefully plant a seed in people like you that'll grow into this tree of wonder, this tree of love for nature, love for animals, because at the end of the day, there's an old saying that says, in the end, we protect what we love, we love what we understand, and we understand what we're taught. So hopefully when you come to the zoo and you see these animals, you learn to love them, you learn to understand them, and you want to protect them. Another question you asked is, why is the tiger alone at the zoo? It's a very good question. Because we always think of things like, oh, friends, you know, I would want to have my friends with me, this and that. But the reality is that tigers are solitary in the wild. In other words, they live by themselves. Okay, the only time they come together is to have babies or if a mother is taking care of her babies. But tigers are not like lions. Lions are social cats. They come together in groups called prides. Tigers are solitary. So the only time you'll see our tigers together here is when they're mating to make babies. That's the only time the tigers come together. If you put them together otherwise, there'd be really bad fights. So that's why we don't use the tigers as far as putting them together uh, on other times other than when they're breeding. And the last question you asked is, what do zoos do for endangered species? Well, zoos can do a lot for endangered species. First of all, we learn more about their biology, about what it takes to care for them, what it takes to maybe take care of illnesses, the things they may be facing in the wild. But more importantly, we provide basically an insurance policy against a very uncertain future in the wild. Because in the wild, a natural disaster, an epidemic, predation, poaching, these things can wipe out a population. So by zoos having those captive populations under human care, what we're doing is we're providing an insurance policy. Now, I don't want you to think that the zoo, the animals you see in the zoo are animals that we release back in the wild. That rarely happens, but it has happened. And a couple of examples I'm gonna give you are things like the California condor, uh, the black-footed ferret, the Arabian oryx. These animals would be extinct right now. There would be none in the wild had it not been for zoos working together to captive breed them raise those offspring for release back into the wild and then successfully doing so. So there are species that are in the wild today that you're able to see today because of the work that zoos have been doing. We will continue to do that work. We will continue to hopefully inspire you. I urge you to keep asking those wonderful questions. We'll see you next time on the question and answer period here on Zoo Academy. Take care.